Our next speaker is Dr. Surin Pitsuvan, former DG ASEAN and former Foreign Minister Thailand. Dr. Surin Pitsuvan has been conferred with 13 international honorary doctorate degrees, including one from the University of Bristol, UK. He is now Professor Emeritus at Thammasat University and also an honorary advisor and distinguished visiting fellow at King Prajadhipok Institute of the Thai Parliament. He is visiting professor and adjunct professor and visiting fellow at the Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, Tokyo, University of Nara, Japan, University of Malaya and the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies, Oxford University, UK. Dr. Surin Pitsuvan. Thank you very, very much, Madam. Excellencies, the court chairs, Venerable Mahasanka, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege and a personal honor for me to be standing in front of you, people from various faiths from Asia and other corners of the world. The introduction that Madame had just made about me missed one thing. And that was, that is, I am a Muslim in a majority Buddhist kingdom. And the fact that I became the foreign minister of Thailand for three years, three plus years, between 1997 and 2001, reflect something about the people of Thailand. And that is the mutual trust and mutual confidence in each other are very, very important for societal and national harmony. I've been working as a politician. This morning, this afternoon, Professor Guru Murthy didn't really give much credit to politicians. But not all politicians are bad. In fact, if you want to solve problems of the world, you need them too. Partly, but because they also have their own followings. Because they too have their own followers. So if you have the right kind of consciousness that Professor Guru Murthy was talking about, the right kind of awareness, the right kind of passion and compassion, you can also depend on conscientious politicians. I think you would count Nehru as a politician. I think in some way, in many ways, you would count Mahatma Gandhi as a politician. But they were just of a different kinds and different mold and different mode of leadership. Because they were conscientious about their human responsibility, not only for their own people, but for the entire humanity. Now, this very conference is a reflection of the fact that we do need each other that we are not only bent on collision course or confrontation or clash of civilizations among us. The fact that the theme and the inspiration of this Samwad, one and two, and I had the privilege of attending one in Tokyo in the middle last year. This the inspiration for Samwad came from a Catholic theologian, Hans Kungs, who said there shall be no peace until there are 
peace, there is peace among religions. There can be no peace among religions until there are dialogues. And there can be no meaningful substantive dialogue until you have the understanding of the fundamentals and the substance of all those religions that you want to enter into a dialogue with. So the very inspiration of this samwad is already interfaith, is already drawing the best from the leaders of a different faith, from mine, from yours, from many of yours. So let us settle one point. And that point is not civilizational clash that we are traveling toward, but it should be a civilizational accommodation, mutual respect and mutual confidence. Now, I don't know if you are familiar with one methodology of studying comparative religions. And I think this methodology can help us in our journey towards harmony together in this little planet. There are now 7.3 billion of us, like you and me, in 32 years, 2050, there will be 2 billion more. 9.3.4 billion. Yes, Professor Gumur, Guru Murthy, if we don't evolve that new consciousness, if we, don't that, if we don't develop that new awareness, and I would call it global awareness, I would call it global consciousness. The consciousness that we belong to this little planet together, the consciousness that we own this planet together, not the rich, not the poor, not the middle, but every one of us, 7.3 billion, each and every one of us owns this little planet. And we need to take care of it. But then there is diversity among us. How to manage that diversity so that it would be a source of creativity, a source of mutual confidence, a source of understanding, in the end, a source of harmony among us. There is that approach to comparative religions that I would like to raise with you and leave with you so that you can think about it leaving this conference this somewhat. And that approach is called transcendental unity of religions, plural. Meaning at one level, there is one fundamental truth, but articulated taught, described by different prophets, different leaders, different gurus, different intellectuals in the context appropriate to their own people, their own history, their own environment. Transcendental unity of religions. I come from Southern Thailand where there was a very, very respectable monk among all Thais and foreigners who believe in Buddhism. His name was Buddhasa Pekko, slave of Lord Buddha. And he coined this phrase. He said, there are two languages that somehow have led us into conflict and misunderstanding and mutual hatred among us. 
One is the language of Dhamma. When the Muslims speak the language of Dhamma, it is the same Dhamma. When the Hindus speak the same, the language of Dhamma, it is the same truth. When the Buddhists speak of Dhamma, it is the same truth, same lofty truth for all humanity. But we got caught in this symbolism of trying to articulate that highest truth. And Buddhasa Bhikkhu called it human language. And those of you who speak Thai, understand Thai, Pasa Tham, Pasa Kon. The language of Dhamma and the language of human beings. When we speak the language of human beings, we argue about what hell looks like. We argue about what heaven looks like. We argue about sin. We argue about virtues. But when we speak the language of Dhamma, goodness, practicing Dhamma, detachment, no self, Compassion, metta, garuna, mutita, ubeka, all these features of Dhamma are the same. So let us resolve at Samwad too, this conference, that we should not get caught in the differences, in the symbolism, language is symbolism, that we try to articulate our truth. A Zen master once compared this dilemma of the language of human beings and language of Dhamma in this way. And some of you might have heard. He said, if you use your index finger to point at the moon early evening, a dog would look at your index finger because a dog doesn't understand the abstraction and the object that this index finger points to. He said, but a human being with intelligence will not look at the index finger, will look at the moon because that's where this index finger is pointing at. So let us not caught, be caught in the diversity of the symbolism and the languages that we use to describe that moon. Let us look at the moon. Let us understand the moon. And that's when I think we can find transcendental unity of religions. And yes, this morning there was one point I think extremely important. I'll, I'll stop there. And that point is, let us have a sense of humility in all and every one of us. That after all, we are fallible human beings. We are not owners of the truth alone, absolute, and nobody else. We may be 75% right, 25% wrong. We may be 50% wrong, 50% right. But let us allow others to also have the right to be wrong and to be right. And that would lead to a sense of humility that I am humble enough to know that I don't own the truth alone. There are others who see it differently, maybe the same thing, but describes it differently because of the human language, because of the Dhamma language. And let me tell you, this is not an Asiatic wisdom. It may be ours too, but it is not absolutely ours alone. Socrates said the same thing. I know that I know nothing. 
I am only a seeker of the truth. I am not in possession of the truth. But I respect your way. And you should respect my way. Therefore, the dialogues of Plato describing how Socrates walked in the agora, in the marketplace of Athens, seeking people who know more than he did. And at the end, he said he found none. Well, we can assume that, yes, he was probably the most intelligent human being at that time. But he did not foreclose the possibility that others probably could also share the glimpse or a glimpse of the truth, just like he did. That's philosophical humility. And I think if all religious leaders, all religious followers, all of us, can live with our neighbors with that sense of humility that you too have the right to be right and to be wrong just like me just like every one of us I think harmony is within reach and dialogue yes dialogue with humility will lead us there good luck thank you very much <clears throat>